He didn't care. Felicia's dead. She was in the room. We're going to prosecute her for murder. That's the case that they give you. No effort. And they give you distorted photos. He didn't even know what the focal point was, the focal uh, of the lens, the length of the lens, focal lens, sorry. Focal length of the lens is, you know, under 50, it's wide angle, over 50, telephoto angle, 50, it's perfect. Well, it's as you see it. Okay? I had to go into the properties and show them, isn't it true this is 28? Isn't it true this is 35? Oh, okay, whatever you say. That's the detective. But they want you to somehow look at these photos and say, oh yeah, I want you guys to judge this based upon a wide-angle photograph that distorts the distance. I want you guys to judge this. He yeah, looks about three feet or four feet or five feet. And when we tell you that it was 18 to 24 inches, somehow that should have meaning to you. They want you to eyeball it. Imagine eyeballing. We're now, we're now in the eyeballing business. We're no longer in the criminal justice business. We're no longer in the proof beyond a reasonable doubt business. Apparently we're in the proof beyond a reasonable eyeball business. That's their case. They bring you one cell phone extraction from one day. That's it. From one day. They have all of the cell phone extraction. The guy who testified, nobody asked him to look at it. Oh, they only asked him to look at it. Really? Really? You know what? I don't even believe that. Because you knew darn well they were desperate for a motive that the best that they could come up with was a text message on August 6th from Tina Mom. You know darn well I suggest that if there was text messages going back and forth between Felicia and Laura and nothing each other or hostility or anything like that providing a motive, you would have known about it. Thousands and thousands of pages of cell phone extractions at their disposal and not one thing in there. Not one house, not one iota, not one mind suggests any hostility between these two loving people. Get to figure out. I got you one day. Oh, let's look at this. Oh, her mother called. Oh, her mother called again. Oh, Laura's mother. Oh, this is her father trying to get a hold of her. Oh, it's a crime now to panic and freak out and reach out to your parents? That's now a crime. That somehow means that you're a cold blooded murderer as you're holding your dead wife and, and wiping away her blood and you're crying and crying and calling your mother and calling your father you don't know what to do. I'll tell you right now, he didn't know what to do. Nobody knew what to do. The father finally got off of work and he went to the police station and says, I don't know what's going on, but can you go over there, please? Nobody knew what to do. They left you. He was so sad to speak to her. They never came, she said. They never came. The last text message at the end. Nobody's here. I, I'm going to take off. She didn't. She didn't take off. In the statement, what did she say? Well, I'd like to see my mother. Why? This cold blooded woman. What did she say? Why she wants to see her? She wants a hug. She wants to see her mother for a hug. That's a cold blooded woman. They had no investigation. They didn't care. They have no personal knowledge whatsoever as to what happened on August 6, 2017 at North Street. No personal knowledge. And they made no effort to independently, forensically, or otherwise find out. Oh, they, um, they didn't get the phone records. They're going to show you this, and that somehow the time is going to have meaning to you because it's in a, it's in a, a, a computerized cell phone that we all know sometimes they malfunction. Firearms malfunction, cell phones malfunction. How many times has somebody told you I called you? You know, I, I called you. Well, it's not showing up on my phone. It's not, not on my phone long that you get it. Okay, how do you know? You rely upon a computer thing that can get broken, or do you subpoena phone records from T-Mobile or Sprint? Says me, Sprint. She, you idiot, moved it for him. Go to Sprint. Find my record. Just see what was a real call, what was not a real call, and the times. No records from any of the phone companies from for, for, for Felicia, for Laura, for her mother, for her father. Nothing. They're gonna, they're gonna extract one day and say, yeah, that's, that's evidence for you. When the real evidence, the ability to, they can even tell what cell phone tower they're bouncing off of. No effort to do any of that. 
This was the best. This was the best. I'm sitting there listening to this testimony, this S102, and it's, it has it up. It's like on the board here, and it's reading, okay, now this time this happens, and then, oh, this guy's coming at 2 o'clock, and this guy's coming at 11.30, and oh, you know, do you have anything left? Eight separate and distinct people making arrangements, making arrangements to go to the house that morning, that afternoon, that day. Apparently some were there and left. Okay, detective. Okay, good detective. All right, here we are. What you do? Come on, I'm hanging out the edge of my seat. Tell me what you did. What you do, detective? What did you do? Tell me, tell me you went and got the subscription information. And you found out who these cell phone numbers belong to, and you got their names, and you went to their house, and you interviewed them, and you asked them what they saw, what they heard, and what was going on. Tell me about that. Tell me you did that. Please tell me that. Are you serious? This is how the Burlington County Prosecutor's Office runs their investigations into homicides? Any one of us can be that seat, and that's the investigation that they do. We wouldn't expect it for ourselves, and we certainly can't expect it for the world. And more important, they've let you down. They've let you down because they want you to make a decision, an important decision, in another person's life and they fail to give you any objective evidence to help you with this decision. This decision is just important to, to Laura as it is to you, we know that. Nobody takes oath uh, as more serious for burned managers. Been here a long time. It took a long time to select you, a long time to pick you. The only thing I was looking for was someone to honor their own. I'm hopeful, I'm not confident in my family. They didn't even research who owned the gun, who were the registered owners of the guns. Could you imagine that? Step number one. So, 21 is missing of the bullet. You saw my cross examination of Mr. Smith on the ballistics lab, right? Even though David Williams said it was 115 <coughs> grams, oh, well, that's not really 115 grams, it might be 124 grams, whatever. I, I'm not going to go through that, I'm too tired, but <laughs> you'll have it. Deposit ammunition, it says on the side, 115 grams. It's 115 grams, okay? So, I'm testing grams, grains, grains. So, now, there are two sets of fragments, so I would say. One is known as 16, and six, number 16 is the one that was in the back of the head, exterior, and the others are 17, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And you add both of them up, okay, and it comes to 90.1 grains recovered. That means that there was, I forgot the, the math, 24.9. <laughs> um, and you do the, the equation, the calculation, and it's 21.7% of a bullet missing. That's a lot. That's huge. 21.7% of a bullet is missing. And not only is that much missing, but the nose of the bullet, the part that first hits, is missing too. So I thought that was very interesting. And then I asked him at the end of his examination, let's you can recall, about ricochet bullets. And I asked him whether or not ricochet bullets can be deadly. And he said, absolutely. They maintain their velocity. Okay. That bullet had to have struck something pretty hard for the nose to come off and to lose almost 22% of it. Very interesting. And 
it lost that before it even entered Felicia's body. 22% missing and the notes before it entered Felicia's body. And my point is, have they even convinced you beyond a reasonable doubt based upon this? Have they even proven that the firearm that she was loading was even pointed in the direction of Felicia? Do we even know that? Look what's missing. There's objects dressers, metal knobs, all over the place. You know something else that happened? You didn't hear one witness testify. You don't see one photograph of that blue tarp being moved and anyone looking under the blue tarp. That's the kind of investigation that you hear. There's no before or after. You can only imagine what's under that blue top. 22% of the book and the notes that bounced off the dresser and landed under her eye. You know what? We don't know, do we? Doubt. Reasonable doubt. That's the point. decide to just to figure out uh, what perhaps they can identify as a distance between where the gun was and where Felicia was? Are you kidding me? Should you have done that two years ago? What happened three months ago? Like, oh, aha. Uh -huh. hmm, maybe we really don't have a case and we have to somehow do something to pretend we have some case. Okay? I call it the high school science experiment because that's what it sounded like to me. High school science experiment from 1998. That's what they did. Goes to Staples, which if anyone's ever been to Staples, these, these boards here are not in plastic, they're just loose for to buy. They cut them down, they bring it into a dirty range, they don't use gloves, they, they fire from certain distances. There's not a picture holding the tape measure, okay, now we can assure ourselves we're at 6 inches, 18 inches, 24 inches, 30 inches, no independent proof where they were. Poor man's hands were shaking. Who knows where they actually were when they shot? And after they shot into these panels, okay, is there any test, any chemical test, any forensic test, any scientific test to show, okay, this is a gunpowder. It's powder. It's not like it's burning a hole. It's powder. This stayed here from a gunpowder, but this was here before. And this is here because I touched the, the wall and then touched the thing and the powder from my hand got onto the how do we know? This is what they do. This is their. This is how they they, they they conduct their investigation. Is this acceptable? And then I say, well, well you know, you had to make sure that he, uh, you didn't dirty it up or anything like that. Oh no, no, I had to make sure that it was in pristine condition. He said pristine. Every panel was in pristine condition. What did I show him? He said, look at this little panel here, sir. As you see this red mark here? Oh, absolutely not. That wasn't there before I put it into evidence. No, no. Really? Didn't you take a picture before you put it into evidence? Yeah. Well, here, sir. Here's the picture. What's on the picture? Oh, it looks like I have the red mark on the picture, too. No kidding. No kidding. This is their high school experiment. Somehow they do this panel test, and then they put it in their car and drive it to Dr. Hood. Okay. And does Dr. Hood use any chemical scientific analysis? Is this a dot? Is this a dot? Is this a dot? No. No. Does he even use a microscope. No. If you take those panels and you put them on the Elmo, which amplifies, you see marks that you can't see from the naked eye. I mean, it's simple stuff. No microscope, no scientific test. We don't know it's dirt. We don't know it's gunpowder. Who knows? And then to top it all off, he tells us it's the best match. This is science now. This is how they want you to hang your hat to somehow have this information and it's going to put 
put in your tool, toolbox of evidence or facts that you have to make a determination in, in the life of, of Laura Bluestein, okay, best match. This is now proof beyond a best match. No, not even close. And then he finally concludes, well, it can't, it can't be, it's not really 100% certain. Really, sir? Not only is it not 100% certain, but forensic pathology textbooks in the field, I confronted him with two, tell us that past 18 inches, there is no correlation between the pattern on paper and the pattern on skin past 18 inches. And what is his answer? All right, well then, I'll just, we'll just make it more than 18 inches. So we got from 18 to 24 inches because somehow that's going to make this look, oh wow, this could have happened and she's lying and you know, we're holding her to her every word. This is their best evidence that we want to prove that she's lying. They don't even ask her in the state where she's sitting on the bed. But somehow now she's lying because some doofus from an experiment from 1998. 1998. But he says, oh, that book you have, that's an old book. Yeah, 2016, sir. In 1990, when was the last time that Dr. Lee taught you this? In 1998. They didn't have DNA back then, I don't think. Well, that's what we have. Best match. Oh, and he tells us that, you know, he's eyeballing you. Somehow, that's supposed to be helpful information to you in this case. The time of death, death number 13. Uh, I asked Dr. Wood about rigor mortis, and he told us um, that it takes four hours. In four hours, you have rigor mortis. <coughs> 6 41 p.m., there was no rigor. That's when the EMT people came. 4 04 a.m., there is rigor. What does that tell us? That tells us between 6.41 and 4.04 rigor fell. We don't know the exact time, but the only thing we can know for certain is that if you take 6.41 and you add four hours, you a little tired. Subtract four hours. It gets you to 2.41 a.m. I'm sorry. 2.41 p.m. Okay. That means that at 2.41 p.m., Felicia was still alive, and she had to have died after 2.41 p.m. Of course, before 6:41 when they got there. Oh, before I suggest 3:30, you know, 3:34 p.m. time with the Lowe's video um, during that period of time. And um, why am I mentioning this to you? Because in the course of discussions, it was, it was suggested by the prosecution, and if he comes up here and tries to suggest this, that at 1:49 p.m., where it says, "Hey, Tina, we're working things out. Sorry about earlier." that somehow Felicia is dead and Laura is texting this, it's inconsistent with the medical evidence. Um, you know, I asked him about the different factors that you take in consideration with respect to time of death. He says there are different factors that you can use. And this, he tells us, is one of those factors, and it's four hours. So, like I said before, down number 14, I don't get to uh, come back up. And as I'm sure you figured out by now, I try to take my responsibility for my client very seriously and try to think of everything or anything that could possibly suggest to you as to why they believe she should be convicted of anything in this case. The first, I mean, this is a no brainer, they have to tell you that she lied in the statement, right? Because if she told the truth in the statement, then this would be not guilty. So they have to tell you she lied because they would have no case. And the mechanism of telling you she lied, I would imagine, is three things they would use. Um, the distance, what we just discussed, I suggest to you, you know, the distance, oh, it had to be 18 to 24 inches. Somehow that proves she lies. Um, the angle, a little downward, somehow that proves she lied. And um, inconsistencies that they suggest to you in the opening that are in Satan somehow, that somehow proves she lied, even though I went through, what, 25, 26 independent facts that are independently corroborated in the statement. So if you would even remotely suggest that there's inconsistencies in the statement, which I think she alluded to in the opening, um, 
you have to ask yourselves first, why, why, why the double standard? Because if she was a police officer, they would never be questioning her that day, when she's under the trauma and um, horror of the event. Never be questioning her. And why? Because if you question somebody under stress, under trauma, under that situation, your ability to recall and recollect, you get inconsistencies, and insignificant facts, I suggest you. Um, so they'll give that uh, privilege to law enforcement, but they won't give it to us everyday civilians. All right. Yet they want to somehow use it, somehow, oops, you know, I, you told me here that you, you don't drink alcohol, but over here you said you might have a beer or two. Oh, that's a big lie. Because that's what he said in his opening, the inconsistency about what she drinks. <coughs> she wasn't even drinking that day. Well, at said she was drinking. But the fact that she says she doesn't drink and she has cirrhosis of the liver and maybe has a beer or two, therefore she's, aha, uh -huh, telling a lie throughout the entire state. I don't know. Um, Detective LaRosa. He was an interesting character. Did you see him? I'm over here. Right. Question him. Hey, detective, over here. He's sitting there staring right at you. With, didn't look at me once. He did when I found him a few lies. Didn't look at me once, for the most part. He stared right at you, and when he was done answering, he smiled just like almost creepy. Like bad acting, almost. I don't know what it was. But it certainly was not genuine. Okay. And they tell you, they, you know, they say your eyes uh, or mirror to your soul. In any event, that's the type of gentleman who was in the room with Laura attempting to confuse her with the facts. I don't know. Um, I liked it in the beginning where she said, can you tell me your social security number? She tells the social security number. He said, thank you for that. I really appreciate his social security number, and that's, that was his response. I mean, you know, he's in this disingenuous effort to manipulate her to catching her in some lies. And what does he do? He confronts her with false facts. Not once, not twice, not three times, but four different times. Okay, so when did you put the body on the bed? So if she says, okay, yeah, the body was on the bed, ah, oh, she lied. Well, you know, she did. How many times did you say to him, oh, please don't put words in my mouth, or don't misuse, or you're confused, or, you know, I, I didn't know what that was about. And then, um, he can't, he couldn't even get straight. He would take one answer, yeah, we last shot um, a firearm a month ago, and then later on the same, he goes, so you last shot six months ago. I mean, the poor girl is mourning the loss of her wife. As a result of a firearm, she had in her hand the blood gushing, wipes her face, hugging her, kissing her, crying, the trauma and emotion and the franticness that must have been going on in her mind. I, I can't even imagine. And and he's grilling her and grilling her about insignificant facts, and somehow they come up here and suggest to you, oh, she could keep the story straight about when she last shot the gun or whether there was a safety class involved. Come on. We don't need a safety class. I told you everything there was about a safety class with this firearm. That was not a safety firearm. Not even in the manual. But my point is, this, this, is, this is the best case they have. The best that they have. And despite all that, she said best and maintained to them that it was a free accident. Over and over and over. And her demeanor, you saw it. Her demeanor was real, it was raw. So big deal, she called her parents. The location of the wound, he mentioned something off. The location of the wound, because it's under the eye or in the face, somehow that means it's a murder. Really? So accidental discharges can't go into somebody's face? I'm not sure there's rules on this. Um, the distance of the wound. So we talked about that, but again, my point is, is, is there a certain distance, like past 18 inches or... You know, maybe, is there a manual like at 25 inches only or 6 feet only? It's a accidental discharge and anything closer it's not? Come on. Suspicion. So just them trying to, if they suggest this, pretend they have evidence when they just don't. The bloody photos, I mean, he's about to suggest. And here's, here's, here's poor police, look at this, look at her face, look at the wounds. That was 
Wilson was horrified. And the poor girl laying there with the doll crying. No. Why did they show you that? Why did that prove? Why? Why, why, why did they have to upset the family? Why did they have to show this? They wanted you to look at everybody's reaction and they wanted you to have like, sick feelings in your stomach. Oh my God, this poor girl, we have to convince somebody. Come on, it, it proved nothing. Why could Dr. Ruth get a phone with the same self and say, the end went slightly downward? Which is what he said. A little downward. But they have to show you a photo. Did you really enjoy that photo? I mean, it's just terrible. But that's what they have to do because they've got no other evidence. Nothing. Nothing. Shock value. You caught me in the evidence cache. I slipped a note to my colleague. I was just feeling better now. She kept the flip. I was praying that I didn't get it. We were also in sick, but it's fine. I just need to put her down a couple times. She's here. Um, but I, I slipped a note. You know, every single piece of evidence, they walk past you. Look at this video. Look at this video. Because they have nothing. The shovel. I slipped a note. The shovels are going to be last. I'm not sure to say that I've shoved it. Guess what? I had to down the witness stand, and the shovels were last. There's the shovel. Look at this horrible thing. She was going to bury her life. Shocking all Manipulation. It's not evidence. It's absolutely not evidence. Think about what they did for me. Think about what they did for you. By the way, this evidence comes with you in the jury room, so it's not like this is your only opportunity to see it. All of this goes in the jury room, so if you wanted to see the shovel, and they know that it's not a secret, we've done this before. respect to this, and then I'll just move on quickly. But in my opening, I've talked to you about these aha moments that I believe would come throughout the course of this trial, which it would be apparent to you that this was not an intentional shooting, and that this was a hor horrific reaction. And I believe it came out through the indicative of the malfunction, through the detective bullet, the indicative of the detective bullet, five in the hair that came from detective um, Dr. Hood, the missing large portion of the bullet. All that medication, all that medication is prescribed to her just that week. Muscle relaxers, Xanax, Lexapro, Methadone, medical marijuana. And a sister going is recalled for the same thing that we're complaining of. All of this important facts, important facts that you don't talk about the trial. Not through my voices, through cross examination. They didn't tell you this stuff. Speculation, conjecture, and other forms of guessing play no role in the performance of your duty. Okay. So what happened on August 6, 2017? Was it a gun malfunction? Was it an ammunition malfunction? Was it a handler's mistake? Was it a combination of all three? Was it a ricochet bullet? If you have to guess as to what happened in that room on August 6, 2017, that is not guilty. That is death. If you have to guess, that is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. The speculation, conjecture, and other forms of guessing are no more. These were brought to you to identify to you areas of doubt real doubt that exists in this case, and they haven't proven to you anything else to the contrary. And last, <laughs> the 
and so forth. What a coincidence that a woman who tells the police that she experienced an unintended discharge while loading a gun has a gun that has evidence of malfunction, that has a bullet fragment in the case that is indicative of a bullet being defective, that has a bullet that's missing a nose, and a sister gun recalled for doing the same thing. What a coincidence. Yet she's lying, because she has. So, you don't have to agree with me in all 17 areas of death before the Lord requires you to find my own. Or all 16. Or all 15. If there's simply a reason without, a reason without. Existing in your minds, the law, and your sworn office jurors require you to find them. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll take five minutes to construct the elections. We're back here if we need to. Do not discuss the case. It's not time to begin deliberations.